These characteristic jungles are crossed by major rivers which in the rainy season overflow, forming extensive floodplains. The climate is subtropical, with the summer monsoon accounting for 90% of the annual rainfall. When the monsoon arrives, the vegetation literally explodes, covering everything. The flooded plains fill with elephant grasses, so-called because of their size as they grow up to eight meters high. It is an ideal ecosystem for plant eaters, the many different species that feed on grasses which occupy and colonize it, forming an intricate tapestry. The incredible exuberance of the vegetation is hell for man, but not for the plant eaters who gorge themselves on the gigantic feast that covers everything. At this time of year, the rhinoceroses and a number of species of deer, such as the sambas and the chital, spend many hours here. Just a few hundred years ago, the Indian rhinoceros grazed on all the floodplains of the Indus, the Ganges and the Brahmaputra, but now it has been reduced to just two national parks, Chitwan in Nepal and Kasiranga in India. This region called Terai forms the northern border between India and Nepal and is occupied by ecosystems characteristic of the salt forests and grasslands flooded by seasonal rises in water levels. These are the lands of the Indian rhinoceros, the final refuges of the unicorn. Here in the Kasiranga National Park, the river Brahmaputra floods over every year, fertilizing the entire plain with silt so rich that the vegetation is among the most exuberant, the variety of species among the greatest in the world. Three quarters of the park is then flooded, and when the waters retreat, innumerable swamps and marshes called Mihils remain. This is when this wildlife paradise really comes alive. Seventy percent of the world population of Indian rhinoceroses live here. For them and for the Asian elephants, water provides a refuge from the heat and a place in which their enormous body weight is a little easier to bear. In 1985, this park was declared a World Heritage Site, and to preserve this treasure, the Indian government put into action one of the greatest conservationist initiatives in the world. In Kasiranga, there is one guard for every square kilometer. Another of the treasures of these jungles is the only animal capable of taking advantage of the meat of herbivores as large as the great buffaloes. It is also hunted by the poachers, but its major concern is finding enough to eat. The presence of the tiger is the cause of one of the greatest problems, the coexistence of the national parks and the people who live close by them. In the country as a whole, at least 50 people die every year from tiger attacks between three and five in Chitwan alone, almost always due to imprudence on the part of the victims. But the tiger avoids humans whenever it can. It would rather risk its life trying to bring down an enormous buffalo. This one has been badly injured in a fight with one of the great striped felines. Its hindquarters, its back and its face have been clawed and bitten, and it has lost an eye.
With humidity of around 90%, the wounds will not easily heal, and internal infections will kill it. Separated from the herd, all it can do is wait for the tiger to return and finish off the job. Now it is easier to understand the function of the armor-plated skin of the rhinoceros. You can eat in peace if you have that kind of protection from possible attackers. But our unicorns have a taste for the high grasses of the banks of the swamp. And both in Gasiranga and here in Chituan, these grasses are also a valuable resource for the human populations living around the edge of the park. Since 1973, when it was declared a national park due to the fact it was the only place in Nepal where rhinoceroses remained, a number of human settlements have been moved. The people transferred to more fertile places without wild herbivores. However, 310 villages have not been able to be relocated and they remain in direct contact with the park. When the season arrives, the local inhabitants cross the river and enter the reserves, armed with their recently sharpened sickles. Here they find what they're looking for. The natives have a legal concession to harvest the high grasses each year. Around 60,000 people gather almost 11,000 tons during harvest time, which lasts for 15 days or so. The bushels accumulate, reaching a market value of some $450,000. After taking off the costs of permits and labor, the net contribution to the local economy is around $250,000. As well as the income from sales to the paper industry, the grasses are also a basic construction material for these people. They are also used to feed the domestic cattle, which cannot stray far in search of pasture, for fear of being attacked by tigers. The heavy monsoon rains make constant repairs to the roofs necessary. This is also done with dried grass. Wherever in the world there are people living in a subsistence economy, we only need to see what the roofs are made of to know what is the most accessible, cheap local material. Underground water, clean and healthy, is fortunately abundant. And from this and the soil, the women make adobe, which of course also includes grass among its ingredients. But not all land uses are as uncontroversial as the harvesting of elephant grass. Wheat and cotton fields are slowly replacing stretches of jungle. Here, man is constantly present, carrying out the different tasks in the course of the year. And this creates problems with the local wildlife. These towers, called machams, are watchtowers from which to spot wild animals. There is always a lookout on duty, ready to raise the alarm whenever a tiger or a rhinoceros enters the fields, posing a threat to the workers' lives.
In reality, all the animals are doing is returning to places that were always theirs, but which little by little have been stolen from them by man, who knows how to turn to his advantage the greatest enemy of the jungle. Thank you.